All right, so we're going to start chapter six, uh, which is actually unit 3A, uh, conventional energy. So we're going to break chapter six up into two parts, conventional energy, like where we are now, and then uh, unit 3B or, will be about alternative energy sources. So let's hop right into this. So you can see from this uh, picture here, I, I, I grabbed three pictures and they kind of represent three of the main things we're going to look at. The one on the left is natural gas burning. The one in the middle is a big coal mine. And the one on the right is a petroleum uh, distillation plant. So it's that's what we're going to talk about quite a bit in this particular chapter is natural gas, coal, and oil. What are fossil fuels? Well, fossil fuels is a general term for buried combustible ge geologic units uh, made up of organic materials. So they've derived from you know plants and animals that have been converted into oil, gas, and coal over millions and millions of years. So they were buried, compacted, and they can get, got converted into fossil fuels. Now we, as a or everyone on Earth here, we consume 11 billion tons of oil a year. That's crazy. So the the, the crude oil reserves are, uh, you know, what we have left on Earth are vanishing, as is natural gas and coal. And we'll talk about that as we get going. So fossil fuels are the primary energy source for the entire world. We use gas for our car, which comes from oil. We need electric power that comes from coal. And the natural gas is used in all kinds of things like your furnace, you know, people have natural gas stoves, and that's also derived in the same sort of sense from uh, uh, where oil is found, and you'll see that later on in the slideshow. What is coal? Well, coal is a sedimentary rock that's made up mostly of carbon. Humans are mostly carbon and water, right? And uh, all living things are made up of carbon, and when they die, you know, plants die, animals die, they decompose. And that down, they decompose down to the most basic element, which is carbon. Then once that gets buried and compacted and over millions of years, it becomes a readily combustible rock, essentially. Combustible meaning it burns. Um, so it consists of... Uh, um, hardened chemically altered and just smushed up you know de decayed plants and animals now if coal is fall found all over the world um, however it's predominantly in certain places like where there used to be forests and marshes prehistorically now we're, again we're talking millions of years ago um, some of the largest coal uh, deposits are located in the Appalachian Basin Appalachian Basin in the eastern U.S., like West Virginia, Virginia, Pennsylvania, the Illinois Basin, and there's some out in the Rocky Mountains as well. There's a huge, some huge coal mines out in like Wyoming. Now, coal is the primary source of fuel for electric power. All, almost all your your power plants, unless if they're nuclear, are coal fired. So like I have one maybe about 10, 15 miles down the road from me. That it's a very large power plant right, sitting right on Lake Michigan. And you could see the, the trains come in with you know, hundreds of bins of coal. And they have these huge piles, like two, three, four, five stories tall of coal sitting there that's going to eventually get burned for steam generation, which converts steam, turns turbines. The turbines then create electricity. So coal is the primary source of uh, what we use when you flip on a light switch or you're playing your video games or whatever. That's almost all coal powered. Now, how is coal formed? And I've mentioned this already. Well, it, again, it's plants and animals, typically in like wetlands, jungle type places where you have lots and lots of vegetation and it gets buried and compacted. Now you can see in the il uh, illustration on the right, there's sort of several phases of this, depending on how long it's allowed, the, the coal bed, so to speak, this layer in here is allowed to be compacted over time. So 
that also gives us four different types of coal. Now, if we start at the, uh, I, the way these are written here, we actually start at the bottom. So this one down here at the bottom is super compressed. It burns very hot and is sort of the holy grail of coal, and that is called anthracite. All right, sorry, my lines aren't very well good there. So anthracite is the best type of coal. It's hard, it's brittle, um, and it, it, it allows you to burn very hot without you know burning up very fast. So unfortunately, the bulk majority of the coal is not anthracite, <laughs> but that's sort of the best variety of coal. The next is what's called bituminous coal, um, sort of in the middle along with subbituminous. Uh, but the point is, is this is where um, it's the common type of coal used for electricity. Um, and so most of the coal that you see in the coal cars in a train is going to be what's called bituminous coal. That's what's used at the power plants mostly. And then you have a, a, sort of a middle area in here, this subbituminous. And then finally, you have what's called lignite. And lignite is sort of the beginning stages. It's still flammable but it's just not very efficient at how it does it. You know, when you when you burn this stuff to generate electricity, you want it to burn as hot as possible to create as much steam. And unfortunately, lignite is, you know, the lowest grade of coal, has the least amount of carbon and just doesn't burn as hot. Whereas on the other side of that, the anthracite here up at the top, that stuff is super hard, super full of carbon, and burns very, very hot, which allows it to make more steam more efficiently. So that's how coal is formed. It's basically dead plants, mostly plants and some animals, that have been buried and compacted over millions of years. So when you start to mine this stuff, you know, it's a non-renewable source. All of these that we're going to talk about today are non-renewable. If you remember that from previous chapters, that means once it's gone, it's gone because these these coal beds and oil and gas, they take millions of years to form. And we'll, that'll be a common theme throughout this entire uh, lecture. So where is the coal for, found? Well, I, I just concentrated on the U.S. There are obviously coal. There's coal all over the world. Uh, there's huge coal mines in Russia and Africa. They're all over the world. But in the United States, this is where they're primarily found. And for, you know, for many, many, many years, the bulk majority of the coal came out of here in the Appalachian Mountains. Then they found a whole bunch here. And then eventually in the western part of the state, like I said, this is, this is Wyoming here, right here. And there's huge coal mine out, coal mines out there. I actually saw one. I was out there for a summer for school way back when, and uh, th that was probably one of the longest trains I've ever seen. I think there were like 10 engines. That thing had to have been several miles long, and it was nothing but coal cars. So it, it is huge, huge coal mines out there. But, you know, again, when this stuff runs out, it runs out. Now, there are there a lot of environmental impacts when it comes to coal mining. Um, the picture that you see on the right there is what's called mountaintop removal, and that's in the Appalachian area, like West Virginia. And it's a very, very controversial type of thing where once they find the coal mine, the coal beds, they just basically strip off everything in its way to get at it, and it basically defaces the entire mountain, as you can see there. Now, we need coal because our entire electricity grid pretty much depends on it. These are sort of the downsides of having that. And if you've never heard of some of this stuff, they've been, it's been around a long time. It's very controversial. But the, looking at the, uh, the bullet points over here, the first one is destruction of landscapes and habitats. And as you can see in the picture there, you know, anything that used to live there has been displaced. It's a huge scar on the landscape. And there, that's not – that's – there's tons of these out in, in West Virginia, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. There's not just one. <laughs> They're all over the place. Um, if a mountain happens to be standing in the way, they just basically level it to get at the coal. The other thing is deforestation. So as they're stripping away all the ground, they're also taking away all the trees. And by doing that, that causes erosion. Well, okay erosion right well the problem is is that erosion is going right into the coal 
now because the coal is exposed. You can see that in this picture. This is coal. All right. So if you can imagine water coming down this way. It takes that coal, the water goes through the coal and grabs bits of it and keeps flowing. Eventually, it's going to flow into a river. So you have bits of coal and everything getting into the river. Now, coal is high in sulfur, um, especially the lower grade stuff. It has a lot of sulfur and, you know, it has, the, that's where we get our greenhouse gases from. So there's a lot of things going downstream and that can kill fish, plant life, and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, and not to mention it can reroute rivers because you got these big gouges and it can actually block and cause, cause flooding. And then I, like I kind of alluded to, it also contaminates the groundwater. You know, all of this exposed rock is getting back into the groundwater system um, because it, it, it's now exposed. You know, you, it's open to all rainfall and then it gets carried into the water system eventually. Um, acidic water can flow out of mines, and that's a huge problem, especially for abandoned mines. Um, and again, a lot of this is sulfur-based, so you got to be very careful with that. It creates a diluted hydrosulfuric acid. So you take sulfur, combine it with water, and now you have a, a slightly acidic environment, which then wears away at even more. It dissolves everything around it. So it, it can cause some huge issues, especially underground, where it's getting into the drinking water system. There's also other impacts for uh, uh, coal mining, things like the chemical air and dust pollution. And coal dust has been a massive issue since the day coal was discovered. Um, you could see in the picture in the lower left there of a guy standing at a coal pile and you could see all the dust in the air. I thought that was a pretty cool picture actually. Um, not, I mean, not if you're standing there, it's not cool, but I mean, to illustrate the point, um, mining waste becomes toxic when it's exposed to air and water. Again, because of the sulfur compounds and there's mercury, arsenic, everything that's, you know, in there and all of that dust is being uh, inhaled. Coal miners have what's called black lung. Uh, they get what's called black lung and that's, you know, essentially lung cancer caused by all the dust from the coal. And it's been a problem ever since the coal mine started. And uh, there's class action lawsuits. There's all kinds of crazy stuff. And, it, you know, uh, if you read a bit more about coal mining, it's considered one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. So, oh, sorry about that. I forgot to mute my phone. All right, there we go. <laughs> um, coal mining is a very perilous uh, profession. So... You know, you, those people, they know the risks, but, you know, a lot of them, that's their, their, their livelihood. They got to work. The other thing with coal is the methane in the atmosphere. Coal mines uh, emit methane, you know, it's from trucks. You know, there's a lot of trucks, obviously. Uh, fuel and everything. Uh, it's, it's crazy um, the, the amount of stuff that's being emitted into the air just from one single mine. Um, <clears throat> and then finally you have coal fires. Well, you know, we use coal, we mine coal because it burns. That's the whole point of mining coal is because it burns. The problem is, is if it gets ignited, it's essentially an, uh, a, a, a fire that's never going to get put out. So if you look at the upper left picture there, that's actually in India. I had, to, I had to include this, even though it's not in the U.S. That's actually from India. That fire has been burning for over 100 years. Um, that was the, it was in a, like an Indian newspaper or something, it's a, the 100 year fire. Once it's ignited, I mean, it's almost impossible to put it out because it goes into the ground. There's places in the world that, you know, just like that. I mean, it, there's one in America too that's been burning for like 50 years. And uh, they're hard to put out because you can't get in there, the, the fumes and everything, or it's too hot or you just can't get at the fire because it's underground. So it's, it's, it's a definite hazard uh, for coal mining. There's also, like I alluded to, the, the human impacts of coal mining. Um, you know, coal dust inhalation is by far the biggest one. 
uh, where you you have what's called black lung disease, like I mentioned, <clears throat> and you, you get things like uh, COPD and kidney disease, and obviously cancer. So you can see in the graphic here, though, that's Kentucky, West Virginia, a little bit of Tennessee and Virginia there. That's where the a lot of the coal mines are. Now you can see the red there, those red areas, that's that mountaintop removal I mentioned. So in that picture that you saw in West Virginia, there's a whole bunch of those. There's a lot of scars left from all the coal mining. <clears throat> and you could see the deaths from cancer. Now those are some older numbers, but they still get your point across. Uh, you know, cancer deaths are higher in areas where coal is being extracted from the ground, where you have lots of coal miners. And, you know, again, it's, it's a double-edged sword. Uh, we need the coal in order to, uh, you know, sort of feed the, the power grid, and, but we also need people to mine it. And those people, those are some pretty poor areas. So those are, and those are pretty good, they're very good paying jobs. So that's why they do it. Um, so researchers have demonstrated that toxic dust promotes growth of lung cancer. So all of the every all of the byproducts of that mountaintop removal, like I mentioned earlier, I mean you're <clears throat> the trucks go from the trucks going by to the coal dust to the, the, the everything getting into the water system, all of that plays a role, which uh, amounts to having a higher than normal cancer rates. And then the follow the the the, the other um, human impact is displacement of uh, of people. You know, if you live in that area and they want to remove the mountaintop, you got to go. You know, they, they pretty much remove you. And so not only animals, but humans too get get moved. You don't hear about it as much in this country. Um, but like in China, you'll have thousands and thousands of people get moved for like, let's say, a hydroelectric dam project. Uh, the Three Gorges Dam Project, I think, displaced well over a million people. They had to move, otherwise their their entire city would have been flooded by the reservoir or the building of the dam. So, it, you know, these type of um, operations where you're mining like this, it does take a toll, not just on the environment itself, but on the humans that are around, either live around there or actually work in that environment. Now, coal is an energy source, you know, um, is actually small compared to other ones. Now it's used for our power generation, right? And you can see there's 11, <clears throat> a roughly 11% coal there. However, as a total of the amount of energy consumed, it's actually small compared to natural gas and petroleum, which we'll talk about next. So a huge part of that is cars, right? Transportation, that's why petroleum is 37% is because we need gasoline for our cars and trucks and planes and trains and all that comes from petroleum. So petroleum still wins in terms of the amount of uh, energy, but coal is, you know, that's that's a huge part of our power grid and that's why it's still at 11%. Now you can see that the renewable energy at that 11% has been broken out into geothermal and solar hydroelectric. We'll talk about those in units 3B. Um, so that, that's what we'll be discussing in that section is, is the, the renewable energy sources. You could see nuclear power sitting there about 8%. That hasn't moved a whole lot. Um, nuclear power is very efficient, but people are scared to death of the downsides of things like having a meltdown and for good reason. I mean, I am, you know, I've done a lot of reading and I know quite a bit about nuclear um, power and nuclear, you know, the whole process of it from my master's degree. And um, it's too bad that that problem hasn't been solved because it would, it would alleviate a lot of the stress of uh, having to use like coal, for example, the problem is, is the downside is the nuclear waste is way worse than anything else. <laughs> the byproducts of the nuclear reactors, because that stuff stays radioactive for like a thousand years. So you got to store it somewhere. And right now this country really doesn't have any real way of storing nuclear uh, waste. Um, there was a site proposed out in Nevada called Yucca Flats 
uh, Yucca Mountain. And after billions of dollars and like 30, 40 years of uh, negotiations, it just kind of stalled um, the because people were afraid that uh, if they put all that nuclear uh, waste stuff down in there, that there could be an earthquake or this or that. And they're you know, looking at all of the worst case possible scenarios. So as of right now, there's really no place to put that stuff. So that's why nuclear power really hasn't grown at all in this country. Um, they deactivate nuclear, like Point Beach, the one up in uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin. I think it's Manitowoc. That one's been de decommissioned because um, I think it was just an older facility. They just didn't need it anymore. Uh, but you don't really hear about any more nuclear power plants coming online. And then if you remember the big earthquake in Japan where their nu nuclear reactor got slammed by the tsunami and um, that created a massive, massive environmental disaster that they're still dealing with and will be dealing with for a long time. That whole town that's right next to the nuclear Fukushima area, um, there are still areas in there that they won't be inhabitable for probably a good three, 400 years because of all the re, uh, nuclear radiation. It's sad, um, like I said, because nuclear power is very good, very efficient and much cleaner than coal, but the environmental disaster part of it is much higher. So it's a risk reward kind of thing. So how much coal is left in the world? I mean, that's, that's oh, you know, when we talk about these non-renewable sources, you you talk about, well, what do we have left? Now, the biggest reserves are in the United States uh, and Russia, especially has a ton, China, Australia, and India, among others. And roughly, depending on, uh, you know, the numbers that they know of proven, sort of proven reserves, there's roughly 150 years left of coal. Um, <clears throat> we've already used a ton of it. You got to remember, coal became the forefront at the Industrial Revolution, which started in the late 1800s. So we're well over 100 years into uh, using coal. So coal has uh, been, <laughs> been extracted in mass quantities for a long time. And only gotten more, like, you know, because back then we needed it, right? But there were fewer people. Now there's more people, more electricity, more power grids. So there, we need more and more and more coal. So that's one of the problems that, or, you know, things that we're going to have to deal with in talking about non renewable versus renewable is as the population of the earth explodes and heads towards 10 billion people in the next 20 years. How are we going to be able to sustain the energy needs for all of those people? And the problem is, is, you know, as you have more people, more energy, you're going to need more resources. Well, that's great, but we're coming already. We've already used a ton of them. So that's going to be an issue coming down the road. And that's the reason why things like non-renewable energy sources have to be strongly looked at going forward. All right, so we're going to switch over to oil now. So oil sort of rules the world. <laughs> you thought money did, it's oil, which is worth a lot of money, but it's it's called crude oil. It's a fossil fuel. Again, it's sort of formed the same way, the remnants of ancient marine organisms, such as plants, algae, and bacteria, and creates this sort of black liquid, right? Black gold. <laughs> um, they could found, be found, uh, oil reserves could be under the land or under the sea. And you might have seen offshore drilling rigs. I think I have some pictures of them as we go along. Um, it's a thick, flammable, sort of yellow-black mixture of hydrocarbons that can be separated. And we'll talk about that uh, a bit more later when we talk about, uh, briefly about gasoline. But <clears throat> from that one liquid, you get things like uh, gasoline, what's called naphtha, kerosene, which is also another type of fuel for like heating homes, um, lubricating oils, paraffins, and asphalt. All comes from that one liquid. Um, so, and then all the derivative products like plastics. Plastics come from petroleum products. So the, just that one, that ugly looking black liquid, so much can be done from it. And that's one of the reasons why 
<clears throat> the need and um, you, the you uh, the need for oil hasn't waned at all. I mean, in fact, we're using more now than ever because it's being uh, its byproducts are being used just as much as what it was originally for, which is things like gasoline and oil, and like lubricants and things like that. So, oil is king. <laughs> it's as simple as that. That's why those Middle Eastern countries are rolling in the money because they have a lot of it. So how is oil formed? Again, you have an ocean environment here um, on the left. And all of the stuff starts to drift down to the bottom. It sinks. It gets it gets um, buried. And then eventually <clears throat> it, you start to see in here a little bit some of the uh, organisms and everything that gets trapped into these uh, rocks. And they get buried and compacted. And eventually... You get what's called a trapped oil, and then on top of that is the trapped gas. So normally when you have oil, you have natural gas. You get both. Now, some, some places don't care about the natural gas. They just burn it off, like in that picture you saw at the very beginning. Other places, they'll grab both. And in fact, more and more places are grabbing the natural gas, and we'll talk about natural gas in a bit. So these sedimentary layers, this is what they're looking for for new oil reserves. There's a whole science uh, in this. So, and I learned about quite a bit about it. In fact, I could have went to school for that, um, what they call reservoir geology. Uh, and there's big money in that, but it just really wasn't my interest. I was more interested in earthquakes and stuff like that. But uh, I, I, I know people that work for the oil companies and uh, yeah, they make mucho bucks. <laughs> So where is the oil found? Well, the bulk majority of the oil within the confines of the United States is found in Texas. That's obviously the first one. That's called the Permian Basin. And then right after that, you can see down here, and this isn't really a state, but it's all the offshore uh, Gulf of Mexico drilling that takes place. And then you come up here and you'll see this. There's North Dakota sitting up there. Well, they found massive quantities of uh what are called oil shales up there, which they're doing, that's where they're doing a lot of fracking, which we'll talk about in a bit as well. But it's by far, Texas has the most amount of oil available. Um, and this is as of 2019. So this is fairly, this is very new data. You could see in Wisconsin here, we're, we're good. We don't have anything. <laughs> we don't have those rocks that form the oil there. Drilling for oil is done usually one of two ways, either from land or from sea if it's in the ocean. And there's a lot of science behind all this in terms of not only trying to figure out where the oil is, um, using all different types of method like uh, reflection seismology, uh, but then the actual wells themselves are you know, very complicated in terms of making sure that bad things don't happen. Um, and these are just some images you might have seen, you know, the classic well pump here on the uh, the left. This this thing here it is, it, you know, it spins and it goes up and down. And um, the idea is, is that it's it's using a pump and then a, uh, a rotary down at the bottom to help drill through everything. And then sort of once they drill down to the depth they need, they, it kind of just goes it goes up and down, creating sort of a suction um, and it essentially kind of sucks the, the oil out of the, that particular layer. Um, and then in the deep, you know, in the sea, there's different kinds of uh, drilling platforms depending on how deep the actual ocean is at the time. And they, they've gotten this to the point now where they can drill fairly in fairly deep water. And uh, like I said, there's a lot of science behind this. It's pretty interesting stuff. And yes, things can go wrong. And, you know, obviously... We'll talk about that in a bit in terms of like oil spills and stuff, but um, th it doesn't happen very often. And for the amount of oil that's being extracted out of the earth, <clears throat> the accident rate is very low. It's just the problem is, is when there's an accident, there's usually a really, really big one. And, you know, th that's when it's really bad. So what are some of the um, environmental apps, uh, impacts of oil production? Well, I, I'm just going to read these off. And drilling disrupts ha wildlife habitat. So obviously, if you're if you're putting wells up in places where the oil is, 
you know, it could be displacing animal habitats, um, you know, uh, which, and this is true. It's just the one weird thing is, is if you look at where a lot of these oil rigs are, especially like in Texas, they're out in the middle of nowhere, but still something lives there and it's probably disrupting their, uh, their habitat. Oil spills can be deadly to animals, of course. And this is the part that the downside of it, right? You see those images of the birds just being coated in oil and then they got to get washed off and it's it's not good. It's and nobody wants that. Nobody wants that at all. Air and water pollution. Uh, yes, absolutely. You know, these the, the oil wells and everything that goes with the oil, there's usually spills and, you know, things that get into the air that are going to affect the local communities. Um, the dangerous emissions contribute to climate change. So the derivatives of oil are things like gasoline. So even though the oil itself might not be sort of emanating up into the air, it's byproducts like kerosene, you know, uh, gasoline and things like that. Those are all going to eventually get into the atmosphere at some point. Uh, fossil fuel, uh, excuse me, oil and gas development ruins pristine landscapes. Yes, it does. I mean, but at the same time, like I mentioned, the ones I've seen, you know, some of the ones I've seen are out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and then it, it, the last two are sort of, okay, they, you know, turns visitors away. Yeah, I get that. You know, you're, you're not going to go hiking where there's a bunch of oil well derricks out there. I, and I get that. And then light pollution. Um, Again, that's a my I, I consider that a minor thing. The, the the other one, the first five are really important, and the the big ones when it comes to um, oil production impacts. Now let's talk a bit more about what actual crude oil is used for, and you know, again, some a bit more in depth. It's used for everything, for fuel, for airplanes, cars, trains, trucks, to heat homes. Medicines, plastics, I mean, it's petroleum is and its derivatives are everything we do. So over the years, the uh, there have been many, many technological advances in terms of where to find how they find the oil. And now they have these things called oil sands and uh, oil shales that were once probably not uh, able to get to, but are now. And that's where fracking comes in. Again, we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, so the idea is, is you know, the, they're being able to get at these reserves that were once thought, you know, unreachable, which is good because that extends the the life of the hydro, you know, of the the the, the, the energy source. But you know, the flip side of that is at what cost, right? It, and we'll talk about some of that. Um, transportation of oil, you know, there it's in trucks, it's in um in ships you know, big oil tankers and when those things go down whoo that's a big mess that's where the oil spills usually come in is usually from ships or trains uh, but also pipelines that leak um, and you know moving that oil around is just inherently dangerous in terms of it can it can get into anything one little leak anywhere and it's going to contaminate the soil and the water and obviously it's explosive in fires um, there was a massive explosion. It, 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 it oh, I forgot where that was. I saw it on the internet. It was a petroleum thing. Man, that was huge. Um, there is I, I the third bullet point is actually not an impact, but sort of a bonus. I, I just put it on this slide just to kind of I found it and I thought it was kind of neat. So you have all those ocean rigs out out there drilling for oil and over time like anything else they just become either the oil dries up or the technology on that particular rig gets really old so what they do is they'll strip out everything that's you know hazardous and they'll take the entire rig and they'll basically tip it over and let it sink to the bottom of the ocean and once it does that it became becomes sort of an artificial reef and there's a program called rigs to reefs and they've done this with ships, they've done this with planes, they've done this, and those those um, those oil rigs then become homes to la large communities of sea creatures. Again, they strip everything off them that's hazardous. They just it's basically the metal rig itself that's just sort of tipped over and put into the ocean. 
and it helps increase fish populations and diving opportunities. So there is one positive that comes, you know, if you're looking for a positive, you know, at least they're utilizing the fact that the ocean uh, organisms in that particular area can area can use the you know the leftover steel structure as a new home and build a, an entire community around it. So what are the human impacts of oil production? And the, a lot of these are not from actually drilling the oil, but then again, the derivatives of them. Things like, um, you know, anytime you're exposed to any type of hydrocarbon, you're at elevated risk. Uh, things like breathing petroleum vapors, uh, you know, gas vapors, right? We, we've all smelled gas before. Heck, my son thinks it smells good, but you know that stuff will cause nausea, headaches. It can ir irritate your lungs. Um, eventually, if you get too much of it, you'll die. I mean, it's just as simple as that. Um, petroleum products on the skin cause irritations. Um, you can have nervous system, blood and kidney issues. Uh, gasoline contains small amounts of benzene and benzene is nasty stuff it's a, it causes cancer it's a carcinogen so there's lots and lots and lots of things that can go wrong with these types of hydrocarbons and their derivatives um especially you know people who work in the petroleum refining industry have a tendency to have increased uh risk of skin cancer and leukemia uh because of their exposure to these at all the time so you know unfortunately you know, there, these types of products cause major issues with the human body if you're exposed to it for long periods of time. So just like we talked about with coal, we want to say that examine the same thing for oil. How much oil is left? Well, the, they say there's 1.65 trillion barrels of proven oil reserves as of 2016. That means that's the stuff they know exists and they could probably go get. Um, so they're saying that that's roughly 47 years of oil left. Now there are unproven reserves as well, places they think it might be, but might not be economically viable to go get. Again, they're starting to drill deeper and deeper into the ocean. Or what I mean by that is, the water is getting deeper, and deeper, and they have to go down further before they even hit rock and the, um, and then drill, and that becomes a technological hindrance. I mean, they have to figure out how other ways of doing that. Um, it's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> so you know, um, Venezuela has a lot of oil. You could see that. Unfortunately, that country is in complete turmoil. But it has a lot of oil. And unfortunately, the other thing is that a lot of the money that they make from the oil is not going to the people who need it. It's it's, it's basically a dictator regime. Um, then you have Canada, who's big. They have what are called oil sands. So they have these geologic formations that are more sandy in nature that is just saturated with oil. And they found tons of it. Um, up in the you know uh, Alberta uh, province, uh, obviously Saudi Arabia has a ton of it, and the Middle Eastern area, Kuwait, Libya, Iran has a lot. So those areas still have quite a bit in reserves. Unfortunately, even with all those reserves, at least proven reserves, still the amount that's being consumed on a daily basis worldwide only gives us about fifty. 50 years left, so it's going to be interesting going forward. So the final fossil fuel we're going to look at is natural gas, which is formed deep in the earth and is usually associated with uh, petroleum when you're d drilling for oil. The natural gas is lighter, and I'll show you some slides of this. Natural gas is lighter. It kind of sits on top of the, uh, the oil de deposits. Now, um, Natural gas has lots of different compounds, but the main one is methane, and it um, it's used a lot in terms of uh, fuel for things like you know furnaces and you know uh, stoves, heating homes, heating you know it's very efficient that way. Has less hydrocarbon byproducts, but it's still not good for the environment because of the methane.
Just how is natural gas formed? Well, it's formed in the same manner as both oil and coal. You have these um, remnants of plants and animals that build up thick layers, and then over time, they get compacted and uh, they get buried. And between the pressure and the heat, all of those dead critters form either coal, oil, or natural gas. They're all kind of related in that, that regard. Usually when you find natural gas, it's sitting on top of oil, not always. Um, and so what you see here is you you have this this oil, this oil drill here, and then once they find what they're looking for, they can actually go sideways. Um, it's pretty cool stuff. And you'll see this is a gas-rich shale, and this is where fracking comes in, uh, which we'll talk about briefly as well. You have these tight sand gases, and you also have this gray here that you can see. Those, that's what we call a seal. So that's a layer of rock that does not allow the oil or the gas to get above it. It won't, it sort of traps it in its own layer. And what that allows that you'll have things like this where you have a gas pocket sitting on top of oil. Now, some places look for oil and other places look for natural gas. Some look for both. Um, places, you, that's why you'll see some of that natural gas being burned off because they don't care about that, they just want the oil. And other places are looking specifically for natural gas. Natural gas reserves are in a pretty good spot. And as you can see from this map right here, Russia by far dominates in terms of how much they have in reserves. For whatever reason, their geology is just such that they have lots and lots of natural gas available. The United States has quite a bit. Um, you can see there's conventional and then unconventional, uh, meaning if you're just drilling down and that natural gas is sitting there, or if you have to kind of go extract it via fracking, uh, that's what part of that is as well. But in general, even though we don't maybe have as much as Russia, the United States is you know second in line for that, and we have the technology to go get almost any kind of natural gas we want. Now, I want to look at, you know, we looked at natural gas, and I kind of glossed over natural gas because it's in the same realm as uh, as oil in terms of how it's formed and what it's used for. It's used for, you know, heating homes and everything, and it's used a lot. But one of the things that affects us that I wanted to, I wanted to uh, put a slide in for this is gasoline. We all drive either our cars or if you take the bus something is using gasoline unless if it's an electric car like a tesla or something like that um everybody's using gasoline and that's one of the reasons why petroleum is it's the main reason why petroleum is being used up at such a high rate now gasoline is made from crude oil okay and then the thing about oil is i mentioned you have all of these other things that you can get out of it now the little image here on the upper right shows you, okay, so the crude oil comes in here, comes in, it gets heated and boiled, and then as it gets boiled off, depending on the temperature, well, it, it, it's at, that's where it'll come off in their, its different forms. So at the very top, if the first one that comes out is gas, those are, and that's a gas, like in the air gas. Then you have what's called naphtha, which we're not going to go into. And then as it, it gets a little hotter, you get what's called gasoline. You know, that's what we use in our cars. And then you have a bunch of other stuff. And I'm not going to go into all this, but you can see as it goes down, you have kerosene, you have lubricating oils, you have heavy gas oil and whatever's left over at the bottom. The point of this diagram is to show you that it's not just oil that we get from oil. It's all of these things and more from from the oil it's that's where we get our gasoline from and it's crazy to think that over the years all of these different byproducts from just one liquid um, that's chemistry at its finest right there and figuring out how to maximize you know going from that black yellowish liquid into all of these other types of uh, derivatives and it's it's very interesting science actually Now we can't talk about oil 
and gas without talking about fracking because fracking is a hot button ticket item, so to speak. And, uh, you know, there's two sides to every story. And um, a lot of people are against it and a lot of people are for it. And the, the reality of the situation is, is fracking, the, the, the science behind fracking has been around since 1947. This isn't new, but it's only new because it seems to be making the news and has this sort of negative uh, connotation with it now. Whereas, in fact, it's been done for like 60 years now. But what is fracking? So fracking is taking water, sand, and some chemicals and injecting it under high pressure into these shales. Okay, shale is a rock. It's, it's and you know, it, so you're taking it and you're shoving it in there and sort of sandblasting it, if you will, and then they suck everything back out of it and extract everything out that they want. <clears throat> and then they, they kind of repeat that process. Well, what this allows you to do is get at oil or gas that wasn't readily available because it, that it's trapped in that rock. Um, before we would drill down and uh, just, you know, you'd hit a gas pocket or an oil pocket and you'd extract them out. This allows us to utilize the fact that there's high levels of natural gas and oils in an actual rock. The downside is, though, is that, um, you know, the word fracking is injecting the liquid at high pressure to create these fractures, utilizing the fact that and then just getting it back out. But it is creating fractures. And it is uh, there's there are some downsides to this. One of them is um, the uh, all of the water that it uses. So it's using billions of gallons of water to do this, and not necessarily reclaiming it all. And the other part of this is sand. Now, if you didn't know this, fracking requires a very specific kind of ma uh, compositional makeup for the sand. And Western Wisconsin is one of the largest producers, so to speak. The sand that they have in Western Wisconsin fits the fracking criteria almost perfect. So a lot of the sand that's being used in the fracking industry is coming out of Western Wisconsin. Um, so there, there are some downsides for this, especially with these chemical, chemically enhanced water that's used for the injection getting into the groundwater system. That's the biggest one, um, is the potential for groundwater contamination. Uh, there have been, you know, that you also hear about all the little earthquakes um, around areas that have fracking. Now, I don't know, I have nobody is absolutely 100% certain that's what's causing it, although it seems awfully coincidental. Um, from a scientific point of view, it hasn't been proven 100% depending on who you ask. Um, if you read the fracking websites, they'll say, oh, that's a myth. Uh, you know, if you if you live in that area, those people would say it's absolutely because of fracking. So, uh, you know, the jury's still out on that a little bit. But fracking is what it, the, the one bonus, the, another bonus to this that you may not realize is that by a by being able to go get at reserves that were once thought untouchable, in a sense, it brings your the price of your utility bills down because now you have more of it, um, not less of it. So th there are trade-offs. Um, and yes, the fracking industry has a bit of a bad rap in terms of leaving behind a mess. But a lot of that's been handled as well through regulations and oversight. So that's what fracking is. And finally, how do fossil fuels and sustainabilities play a role? Well, we all know, we've already talked about this, that fossil fuels are non-renewable with limited reserves and a hungry population. And that population is only going up. So ultimately, you are going to run out of oil, gas, and coal. It's going to happen. It's just a matter of when. So th this is why it's so important to start offsetting demand for fossil fuel with alternative energy sources. Uh, things like, and that's what the image is, wind and solar. Um, 
you know, there have been many, many technological advances for renewable energy, and some of them are becoming more and more viable. And in fact, you'll see in the next unit, the unit 6B, or, or I'm sorry, unit 3B, chapter 6B, I guess, whatever, uh, that, you know, they don't even consider wind turbines alternate, alternative energy sources anymore because they're actively starting to, um, you know, it's it's a here to stay. It's not going anywhere. Now, one, and what that does is as wind power becomes more prevalent, it reduces our need for the fossil fuels. Now, how many of those wind turbines are we going to need to replace fossil fuels? Millions. Let's just be honest, millions. So fossil fuels aren't going anywhere. But the idea is, is to introduce more and more alternative sources to help ease the amount of fossil fuels that are needed on a, a, on a given day. You know, you know, slow down the amount of coal, gas, and oil that is being needed by all offering alternative sources. And we're going to get more, you know, the whole next uh, lecture will be all about that. I hope you learned a little bit of something in the conventional energy. Now, being in a geology, ge a geologist, this is my realm. You know, a lot of students, UWM, uh, where, I, where I went to school and now I work uh, as my day job, um, we, our students back in the late, you know, mid 80s and um, late 70s and 80s and even early 90s were actively recruited by oil companies. Some of them still work there. They traveled the world. One of the things about oil companies is they've shifted their focus in, in many respects. A lot of them are starting to incorporate alternative energy sources and, you know, they're looking for cleaner, more efficient ways to do things. Um, and I've always said the oil companies are, I mean, they have oodles of money, but they, and they have the, the, the coolest toys, the software they use costs like a million dollars a piece. I, we have a copy of it at UWM. It was gifted to us. It, it was, um, I think it was six copies or five copies totaling like five million or $3 million or something like that worth of software. It's like 3D reservoir um, modeling software. So they get to play with the coolest toys, but they're also under a lot of scrutiny with, from the environmental protection agencies. You know, they, they have a lot of rules and regulations they have to go by now because the last thing anybody wants, including the oil companies, is big oil spills and things like that. The oil companies have to shell out billions of dollars to help clean that up. So that's not helping them. They don't want that. So, all right. So that's the end of uh, Unit 3A or Chapter C, you know, the conventional energy. I hope you learned something like I mentioned. And uh, I'll see you on the next one. Take care. Bye.